So it it took away the the good side, like the they take it for granted the line of opportunity, right? So now it's like even my own people. I went down to Costa Rica a few years ago, and one guy's like, "Hey man, is it true they give you like two grand a month if you just stay home and do nothing?" And I'm like, "Yeah, but you can make millions if you get out of your and yeah. do something." What made you decide to quit your job and start your own business? It's a good question. So I actually didn't quit my job right away. It was more so a progression of um, me adding more skills to the roster, um, identifying needs of the company. And then what happened is when I started fixing those needs, whether that was marketing, social media marketing, outsourcing, that got invoiced separately. I built a corporation and then I started invoicing the company consulting services. In addition to me being a T4 employee, you know, I'm getting paid as a T4, any, any extra work can I'm in uh, as an invoice from the company. Oh, no way. A yeah. business within a business. That's what a, you're doing. Yeah, it's entrepreneurship, which is it's a very safe way. It may not have as much rewards, but you get to experiment. You get to learn on other people's money as long as you provide value. So the Facebook ads, Google ads, a lot of the automation, CRM stuff, a lot of software was paid by the company with their money. And I got to learn and get all those skills. Okay. And it was probably easy for you because they probably liked you as an employee, yeah. therefore they trusted you. And if you're coming to them with an idea, yeah. I mean, chances are they're going to choose you over somebody else. Well, sometimes your idea, you might have to cash flow yourself. Okay. Right. So for me, I, I paid for some software myself at first, right? If, if you need, I mean, it doesn't matter what it, what the process is. Like if you're doing construction and you have an idea for something and you might have to pay for the first idea, you test it. Turns out everybody, boost profits or boost productivity, then the next idea, they're going to fund it for you. Oh, I love it. And now that first influx of cash that you gave them, how much was that in order to start this Google AdWords business? How much money did you have to put in for the software in order to do that test? You know, it wasn't, it was less than a thousand dollars. Oh, that's, wow. That's really good. Which, so yeah. And because I was a commission, I was in sales, it helped me make more sales. And then they wanted to scale that for the whole for the whole store. Oh, wow. And how long did it take you to make that initial thousand dollar investment back? Oh, the same month. So to give you some context, it was going from operating of printed information of leads and in a spreadsheet on, or like a Excel sheet to having a CRM. So it allowed me to be able to do bulk email of 10,000 people, hundreds of text messages at the same time, do a power dialer. So the top sales guy could have had 30 calls, 50 emails, 20 texts by one o'clock. I had 15, 20,000. That's like the volume of outreach that I was doing. Okay. So let's rewind that back. So how did CRM help your current business? By, well, the, my, my current business is outdated for sure. Okay. Let, sorry. We'll go back to that Google AdSense one. I'll ask you the question again. Okay. That's kind of explain that one. So um, you mentioned CRM. So how did CRM help your Google? its business it's not that i have a google out a google ads business it's more so we were special in it's a sales operational business okay so yeah we do some google ads i don't do media thing, but what we do is we convert all the data that from from the ads from the ad creatives from the funnels so i have a sales process that increase the conversion from being five percent of a good process convert of 10 percent okay so you're not buying ads to sell direct you're buying ads in order to get the customer information and then retarget them is that correct basically what i will do is let me give you an example let's pick the the fitness industry and let's just say i go to the local gym i say hey you're getting ads yeah sure let's just say they're getting a thousand ads a thousand leads per month based on those ads and i said are they being worked properly like what is your speed to lead from the moment they submit an application how long it takes for them to get the first phone call, the first text, the first email, and how many attempts of contact do we do before we gave up on that lead? And it turns into just another piece of data in your database. Most people don't have that dialed in. Like chiropractors, dentists, they don't they don't really have, have that dialed in. So then I come in and I say, well, my team can come in. The first thing is we're going to fix your speed to lead. So you go from my, the moment the lead out makes an application, they, they raise their hand, they're interested, they want to know your website, two, three minutes for them to get the first phone call. Oh, wow. So it takes them off the market. That way they, they don't shop. Because the moment you look for something, you start getting targeted ads. And every third post becomes that. If you look for a gym and you submit an application at Good Life, all of a sudden you go on Instagram and every third post is Movari. It's going to be LA Fitness. So imagine they take a day to get back to you. You're not going to be as excited. So you want to get them while they're hot. And what's your closure rate compared to everybody else with this system that you are using? In the automotive business, 
we're probably looking anywhere from 12 to 15 percent now 15 percent used to be an average number a few years ago now people are converting six to eight wow so i can bring it back to what it used to be which is 50 20 percent it's, it's like you're a rock star like you're you're like a top level salesperson and it's nothing special it's just speed to lead relentless follow-up and having the word the right word track and the, the, would you say that most people kind of need a tool to do that because people are you know not necessarily willing to do the work is that where yeah. you come in yeah 100 percent. especially closers so people that close the, the really good closers the, the highest levels of adhd the highest levels of addiction the highest levels of dyslexia a lot of mental problems that, that they're not really a problem challenges that would stop you from maybe going to law school a lot of them if people are really talented still they they, they get into sales so you'll find that the, the the best closers give you the hardest time because they don't update the system they're extremely messy with paperwork they just push the envelope as far as they can so you need to enhance them now with ai with automation and with outsourced labor like having them assistance that would keep them so that nothing falls through the cracks that's the way you empower your salespeople. The, the mistake a lot of a lot of companies make is they want them to do everything and at that point if you have a closer who can close a high ticket item for you and if you have him updating the crm you're you're cutting apples with a samurai sword because that person that 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 what he's doing what you stop him from doing sales to what doing administrative work that could be outsourced for six dollars an hour and him closing can make you thousands an hour but a lot of people People are, are like, no, like we're paying these commissions. We should just, they should do everything from start to finish. So my system is a conveyor belt, uh, conveyor belt approach. So it, it sounds like every single dealership in the world should actually get rid of their non-performing salesmen, yeah. just hire closers and all you make them do is close. It's close. And yeah. you do everything else and Correct. then put the client with them in a room and it's basically done. Is that, is that what I'm getting? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's it. They just they should be closing. You take the prospecting out of their hands and you take administrative work out of their hands and you dumb things down. You gamify things, you one, two, three steps so that way they can just close. And it and it sounds like you'd be saving the dealership money. Yes, your closers would do less work, but the dealership sounds like they would save a fortune. They will save a lot of money in, in terms of staff, in terms of uh, how much marketing they have to do, because you can go from spending a hundred thousand dollars a month in marketing to getting the same results by spending 30,000. Oh, wow. Because if your conversion rate goes from 5% to 15% and raising the marketing budget doesn't translate to more deals because of the capacity of how many deals they can close, then it's only, then the next best thing is to lower. So in the first month, if I get into a dealership and I save them 50% of the marketing budget, that more than that, then that will pace what I'm, my cost is. So I'm cost justified just of what I save the company right off the bat because my bill is not going to be 50K, right? But then the extra revenue, which is always, you know, which doubles every three months in terms of my marketing, my call out bond outreach, increasing sales, all of that. So I save you 50% in marketing and I boost yourself 20, 30%. Sounds like a no brainer. Do you, what is it with business owners that don't necessarily buy into this product? What, 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 are, they, what are they scared of? It's not so much that they were scared of. It's just, it, it, it's the blockbuster thing. It's, we're too big. We're not going anywhere. We're, we're a Dutch store. We're a Cadillac store. We've been here for 30 years. So the blockbuster said that Yahoo said that and Google guys came in and took over, you know, so being resistant to change. Being comfortable with the current setup, that's a big problem. But the thing is, you have to look at the cost of inaction. Like if I come into a business and I say, look, I, I, I made this company a million dollars in six months just by having these emails and phone numbers that they were, that were sitting in their database. So but you not act, but you not work in the database and doing a good marketing outreach while well, you're losing out, right? It's your cost of inaction. It's, it's interesting. What would you say makes a business owner buy? What are his trigger points? If it's a smart business owner, which is smart, the smart has to be up here. Emotion has to be down here. So if he's a smart data-driven person, he's just going to look at the data and set the expectation and be like, okay, it makes sense. I looked at it. Here's a check and deliver. And that's the easiest part. When you struggle is when there is emotions involved. When we've always done it this way, there's no way. But I'm like, but look at it. I don't want to look at it. Do you ever use the tactic where say you come in and you say, listen, I went to your competitor and I brought him a million dollars in six months. Now, this million dollars could have been yours. 
but now it's his. Now, how much more market share is he going to take from you yeah. due to your inaction? So I find fear being a very big motivator. Have you ever used that when you've gone into a sales meeting? So if you don't mind now, the price will be higher or anything like that? Well, a lot of the clients that I have are referrals. So I haven't really been actually at my capacity right now in terms of how much work I can take. But yeah, definitely. So what's it going to take at this point in order to be able to serve more clients? What are you going to need in order to scale your business from here for the next three years? It'll probably be hiring what's what I call a suite. I learned this from the close doctor, Sam Quinn, a good friend of mine. He, he runs an agency as well. But the next step will be hiring a what we call a Swiss Army knife person, somebody who's really good has a good background on Zoom calls, understands technology, understands sales, and understands the industry that we're serving. So that will be maybe a six-figure hire. Six-figure hire. So yeah. a manager, essentially. You're at the point where a, a you need a manager yeah. who can hire maybe a new team. Is yeah. that is that the goal? Who can rep just be another me. Be another you. Yeah, and okay. oftentimes they might have better skills in other parts. Of Maybe he might be a better salesperson. Maybe he might have better leadership skills. Maybe he, he might be better at me in tech. So we just complement each other. That's we came here. I remember coming to Canada in 2005. I mean, me and my brother came here with, on a standby ticket. But there was no refugee status. There was no visa overstayed. It was two years of back and forth, war paperwork, disappointment. Yeah, you're going to be able to live in six months. No, it takes another year. Took two two and a half years to finally get here. We got here. We had a five social insurance number. It was like permanent resident status. Could do everything except vote and join the army, which I tried joining the military, but they, I wasn't a citizen. But it that friction then made me develop this loyalty to the country, this patriotism that people don't have. And then I came here, and I'm like, this is the only. This is not the only country, but this is the one place for me where I look at a Lamborghini. Not that materialistic things matter that much, but it's possible. Or I look at a farm and it's possible. I look at a business, any clothes, everything is so possible here. But that's not happening anymore because now, because we gave away. So it, it took away the the good side, like the, they take it for granted, the line of opportunity, right? So now it's like, even my own people, I went down to Costa Rica a few years ago and one guy is like, hey man, is it true they give you like two grand a month if you just stay home and do nothing? And I'm like, yeah, but you can make millions if you get out of your home and yeah. do something. So, and he's like, I know, I know, but for like, it's, like if I'm eating shit here, I'd rather eat shit in Canada. The shit in Canada tastes better. I'm like, that's the whole wrong approach. Like, like I don't know. It, it, it's there for you to take it. It doesn't take much to make money. It doesn't really take a lot of time. Like a lot. If you want to work, there's so much work. We have a shortage of staff. There's a lot of opportunity, right? So I'm it's, seeing that. It's funny that we say. I always say that people in Canada, poor people in Canada, have iPhones. That's that's the poor version of Canada. Yeah. But that's all you have. And yeah. it's if that's all you need to be happy, then good for you. Now. In that sense, what makes you different than every other immigrant out there? What made you more successful than them? Well, I'm not like super successful, but I mean, I would say making a quarter million dollars a year, it puts me in like maybe top 20%. Top 10. Know, top 10. Easily top 10, yeah. Yeah. So I, I made my first six-figure year in 2020. So, and this is a guy who came from third world country, barely finished high school. And it's not that I'm, I'm not smarter than anybody else. I do work really hard, practice the late gratification in the sense of like, I don't, I mean, I've never been to like a festival, like Drake's concert, stuff like that. You never see me anything like that. I just, I work. I believe when you're in Rome, you do as the Romans do. I, lo I love my culture. Like the Latino culture is beautiful, it's rich, but I'm not imposing it. I, I came here like, and I value the Canadian culture, what we, what they stand for here. So I, I, I believe in, I believe in that. And um, yeah, so for me, it was more like, I'm here, I'm respectful, I'm hardworking. I show people what I can do. I, I'm confident in the stuff that I don't know what I don't know. And I'm always asking the right. I'm always looking. And I'm the type of guy, if you open a door, I'm going to go through it. That's how I've been. My whole journey is one little door open led to this other thing, led to that thing. I got into the car business because I was doing a commercial for a Toyota dealership. Somebody said, hey, man, they're, they're doing a commercial for... I was trying to be an actor. I was like theater and camera and stuff. So like they're doing a commercial for a Toyota dealership. They're, it's like 300 bucks a day in cash. And you just you just have to be a car salesman. So I go there. I do a role of a car salesman for a Toyota, right? And it was on TV and local TV, whatever. But I'm just pretending to be this car salesman. And I ask the casting agent, I said, if I was doing this for real, how much are these guys making? Because if I can play one on TV, I could probably do one in yeah, real life. Yeah. And the guy's like, well, you know, in this dealership, the top guys, this is 2017. 
17. Top guys are making, you know, 150, 200. Wow. And I was like, how do I get into that? Mind you, I don't know anything about cars, but I'm like, I, I'm whatever, I'm hungry. Like, I need to do it. And he's like, well, there was this guy who, who has a, a luxury store in Markham and he's selling Porsches, he's selling you know, Jags, he's selling Range Rovers, Audis, and he just needs a guy who's like good with people. Right. And I went there three months later. I was a top sales guy. And four years later, we opened a store together and then and now I opened my business. Sick. Now. So, OK. Yeah. So what would you say to kids these days who look up to you and who want to be successful? Yeah. What would you stay? And they're kind of nowhere. Right. Some of these kids are, you know, 16, 17, 18. They don't know what to do with their lives. What would you say to them? You know, I have a lot of faith for the Gen Z's people. Every generation goes through a cringe phase. My generation had Vine, and that was the worst <laughs> of my generation. So I don't judge. I, I think we should judge generations once they reach their 30s, because once the Gen Zs reach their 30s, that's when you need to judge them, because that's when they, they're getting married, they have more responsibilities, they start having kids. Like the millennials, if you look at us now, you're not going to think that we're the worst generation, right? Because we're actually starting to like pick up responsibility. We're just, you know, we have so no choice. We ha yeah, we have no choice. We have no choice. The cost of living is so high right yeah. now that you either have to get a second job or yeah. you have to hustle or you have to do something. Yeah. So yeah. for me to like talk this and say this new Gen Z, it's horrible. And they have everybody generation went through that. I do have a lot of faith in them. I think they're they're very smart. The one thing I would say is don't give up on home ownership. Don't give up on business and don't make your online personality your whole personality. So what happens is people give up on all these things. So then their life becomes their Instagram post. And all they have to show for is the stories and these countries that they visited, that they pay for with the credit cards or have no savings. And don't prioritize who you are online at the cost of your real life because you get old and if you do that then you're gonna be 50 and you're gonna have no home no assets and, and the looks are not gonna be there and you don't want to be i have people that i know that started in the youtube game 15 years ago never got out of it and now they're in their 40s and there's and because of the way they position themselves they, they they're doing gossip drama talking about cardi b and stuff and it's, it's just not a good look no and it's it's easy when you're making money to spend money and that's the thing and if you position yourself right if you invest correctly while you're making that big money and yeah. you delay those big trips and you're not constantly spending then right. you kind of don't end up like kevin spacey right now yeah. who had 20 million dollars in lawyers fees and then all of a sudden he's completely broke even yeah. though he was one of the highest paid actors at the time correct it's because when he was making the money he was spending it yeah. so so what would you say are the safest kind of investments that somebody should make? You know, instead of buying a $20,000 watch, right. what do you do with 20 G's at this point? Well, I mean, just say for a rainy day, uh, maybe like three months worth of expensive. But I mean, my, my biggest investment, the one that yielded more, most returns is myself, you know, um, my skill set. Like, it's just, I mean, the fact is that every course that I that I take, even last year I, for, for Christmas, I paid $4,000 for a sales course. Every, every year I spend at least four or five grand on, on self-development. Self-development. Yeah. Now, a lot of people, I'm scared of that. I've never done it, but I've worked with people that have done it and they're excellent closers at this point, but I'm yeah. always apprehensive. Four or $5,000, it's kind of a lot of money, right? So what yeah. are you, what are you doing? And, and, and yeah, what are you doing in these sessions that are four or $5,000? What are they teaching you? For example, like, well, I did the Grand Cardone University and the, the one that was like, it's called the NAPQ 2.0, Near Emotional Programming Questions. It's a new way of selling because the consumer now, it's smarter than ever. It's more educated than ever. They have the most information on their fingertips, you know? Like, you can literally go to Best Buy, look at a, a laptop and then look at the specs on your phone and look at a better deal and leave. Yeah. I've done that. Everyone's done that. Same here. Same in the automotive industry, same in any industry. But uh, understanding sales, understanding how people, their mind works, understanding that the gimmicks that used to work in the 90s, they don't work today, you know, and yeah, in doing consultative selling rather than product pushing. You know, always be disarming, you know, be a problem solver, not a problem pusher. And there's ways you can navigate the conversation during the sales call where, where you're, you're doing that. You get in the problem, the, the customer to open up to you, you get in them to tell you their problems. And by them telling you their problems, they're telling themselves their problems. And your job is to bridge the gap to the desired outcome to where they're at today. Whether that's you have a car that's like getting high in mileage and whatever problems and it's costing you this and you want this vehicle, your job is to bridge the gap. And to do it in such a way that it doesn't cause buyer's resistance or sales resistance. So how do I how do I navigate that call like to, to take you from that to there and for, for you to trust me with that decision, right? So 
there's a lot of strategies. There's a lot of like different modules that you have to learn, connecting questions, probing questions, pattern interrupts, cognitive biases. For example, if I give you an example of a cognitive bias is, you know, um, social proof, right? Instead of saying, I think you should do this, you could say most of our customers do this. It just tells you, okay, people are doing this, right? Or like the cognitive bias co called loss aversion. So for example, like the pain of loss is three times higher than, than the feeling of gaining. Something. So if I tell you that if you keep your vehicle right now, by the time you keep it for the whole term, you, you're going to be paying double the cost because of the interest, that's going to trigger more pain than me telling you, oh, you should trade it in because you can have a nicer car. See, the pain of keeping it is here. Yeah. The, the gratitude of getting a nicer car is down here. They're both asking for the same outcome. But if I trigger this point, it's going to make you think, you're like, holy shit, I'm not keeping this car. No kidding. And it, I think it also puts in a sense of trust between you and the client at this Correct. point. So you're, yeah. you're kind of establishing a bond and then yeah. maybe you'll make money with them somewhere else. Is that is that kind of like, oh, okay, yeah. I've got them now. And yeah. I've heard that. I'm like, no, he's on, he's on. We could sell him anything we want. Yeah. So you've taken all these courses. Yeah. You've taken Grant Cardone. You've taken other courses. Correct. Which one's the best? They were all the best the time they came out. Okay. So today would be NAPQ. NAPQ, um, what yeah. does that stand for? Forgive me. I think it was like neuroemotional programming questions uh, or neuroemotional probing questions. I, I always forget what the P stands for. Okay, but and but questions are always that's part of sales, right? It's right. finding out information, kind of using it. Are is Grant Cardone and all the other? Are they all teaching you about probing questions, or are they no. kind of all talk about it? What what did Grant focus on? Grant is a lot about mindset, positivity, charisma, authority. He does play into some cognitive biases, but he doesn't do the 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 questions where he doesn't really uh, use a lot of tonality in his training. He's more like high energy, high strong. Let's go, good good positive attitude, all of that, which is great. But when you're getting into like high ticket selling, that doesn't, it's different styles of selling. So you do what, what works best for you, right? Um, it's good for me to have knowledge in all of these strategies because I gauge the customer. So this customer is an introverted or, or if he's a very strong person who's not going to buy the whole, like, hey, park the car on the sold sign after you come from the, from the test drive and all that bullshit, then I have to use a more intellectual approach which will be the napq which is more like consultative selling which is more like you know you they're they're, they're telling you stuff and you're in your you look at a psychiatrist you're like hey when, when you say that what, what did that do for you like oh I, I initially i came in and i wanted the s4 and i couldn't get it so i got the toyota most people are most people that say with the grand cardone style will be like okay yeah no problem so let's let's get the toyota let's get something else let's, let's what what you're looking for do you want like the the Audi now, you want to try for that one? You know, it's just like that, right? Whereas the consultative selling, you're kind of like, oh, you got the Toyota. Okay. And, and let me ask you, what what did that make you feel when, when you got that vehicle? And if you were to get the S4 now, how would that make you feel? Okay. Nice. And, and what steps are you doing now to, to do it? Um, and would you be opposed to see if I can work something out? You know, it's the way you frame it. Um, it's it's so much different. At least, and and if it doesn't work out in the end, at least you've gone that, down that avenue. You've satisfied that itch. So then, in the end, they kind of won't regret not getting the S four and maybe going for a Toyota. I think you've yeah. you've kind of solved that problem. You've gone around it. And then yeah. again, I think you're building trust at this point, right? It sounds like that's you what are. You know? And and that's why follow up is so important because yeah, maybe we didn't close on the first call, but now you're thinking. Now I'm in your head. Now you're thinking shit for this payment i could be driving the newer car with like half the mileage you know my in my my interest could be a lot lower now you know so if i hit you up next week with like another question hey man you know i know i know we spoke last week about potentially upgrading your vehicle putting you into a newer car getting rid of the whatever where, where do we go from here they might need more time or they they just say yeah let's just, just hop on another call they want to drive the vehicle whatever yeah but it's just it's just a lot man it, it, it's a game brother it, it's a, it's a sport. It's a game. Is is would yeah. you say sales is a game? It's a hybrid between a game and a sport. Yeah, yeah. It, I love it. I think. I mean, I, for me, it's 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 a, it allowed me to have a good life. Um, you know, there's I live in a good neighborhood, obviously. And you either, I mean, it's I've always lived in good places with like where my neighbors are doctors, lawyers, people that are doing well. You know, engineers. Um. And it's just 
me doing sales. Sometimes I'm like, I have that. I used to have that imposter syndrome, you know, but then I look, I'm like, no, because I did the work. I did the 99 shifts and I did. I'm training just because he sells. I, I've done the 10,000 hours, like, you know, so 10,000 hours. That's to become a good salesman. Is that kind of the benchmark? That's where you gauge. That's it like the, the the standard marker for being good at anything. 10,000 hours. Now, forgive me, math here. How many years is that? Is that years? I don't know. 10,000 hours. It seems like a lot. It seems like more than an electrician, which is like 5,000 or something. Yeah. Well, the 10,000 hours is to be a master at something. So like it's, it's, it's an old quote. It's an old phrase. But if you say, you know, I've done the 10,000 hours in martial arts or whatever, blackjack, it doesn't matter what it is. You, you have to be good at it. There's yeah, no way. No, yeah, I agree. It's it's interesting. I uh, I was recently in Japan and workers there work till 10 p.m. every single night. There's a last train mm -hmm. at midnight during the week. And every single worker there seems to take that last train at midnight. It's a completely different mindset than wow. anybody in Canada because they want to work. They go out for dinner. They go back to work. Yeah. And they don't get home till midnight. And that's just normal. Yeah. And it's foreign to me as Canadians. They want to work nine to four. They yeah. want a two hour lunch and 15, 15 minute breaks and five smoke breaks. Yeah. And by the time you're done, you're not working more than you're working. So yeah. I don't know what it is about Japan versus Canada. Is Do you think it's our government? What, I think it's the government. It's too easy, too, too lenient. I think we, it's a couple of things there. So number one, we're not rewarding the entrepreneurs. No, we're taxing them. We're taxing them. So why would you not go to the States or where? where your money goes a lot further, you get taxed less and you have a better quality of life. So it, it yeah, okay, the way Canada is built is more for like complacency. We might have a more stable mi middle class than the US, but the US has more millionaires because they rewards the risk takers and the and the people who made their good decisions, right? So here's complacency is kind of like the theme. And yeah, and so yeah, there, there's no need and necessity is a virtue, right? So this these people that don't want to work is they don't have to to to, to stay alive and the, in if you don't have to work to to live your life and you're not going to starve and you've given up on home ownership because it's just so out of reach at this point and all you have to live for is to look good on instagram then all you really need is your nine to five right because your life is your your social life your life is social life and then you depend on likes and, and then, then you your likes i kind of factor into your mood every single yeah. day and it's not necessarily a good place to be but it, because everybody's going to get their 15 minutes at some point yeah your instagram will pop off eventually yeah but whether or not it stays up there versus go back down is going to be, it's going to depend on the amount of hustle you're Well, and it's also what it pops off for the right reasons. Okay. You know, because you can, you can say something so outrageous that, you know, that can get you viral, right? But then do you really want that? Do you really want to be the guy who's like doing the most, some crazy, you know, out of line pranks? Do you want to go viral for ripping off some Palestinian flag over to some protester? You know, it's like, you don't want to be that guy. So, but you can go viral. You go viral. You're gonna. You want to go viral for the right for reasons. For the right reasons. And and there's a couple which known, takes longer. Which takes longer. That's right. And there's yeah. a couple of YouTubers that started off doing one thing and then pivoted to another. Right. There's a yeah. lot of successful YouTubers out there that were in the media that did some really stupid things when they were young. Yeah. But because of that fame, they were actually able to pivot. Yeah. But it's that kind of pivot that matters. Right. It's the pivot that matters. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned the United States. Right. What do you think of Donald Trump these days? Oh, I think Donald Trump is what's needed right now. I believe in like checks and balances. So right now, today, yeah, I would say we need a conservative in both countries. Can I, am I going to have the same opinion in 10 years? Maybe not, right? Because you can also go too far one the other way, right? Yeah. Where we're like, divorce is not allowed like it just can get the conservative the right conservative could be really really far where like you can't even you can't have kids if you're not married stuff like that right so in some ways you know I, i'm most people i would say are center something right so i'm like center right because on social issues yes we do have to take care of the elderly i do think we need to close our borders you know i do think we need to make it hard like have some friction there if, if i did it and it was worth it Two years of back and forth paperwork, test this and that, and I had to have education. And I don't know, I even have to get baptized because I wanted to be in the Catholic school system in Canada, right? So that just made me not take this content for, for granted. So a good hammer who can bring back the respect of for, for the Western world will be necessary. I think a Trump Poliev couple of years would be the what we need right now. I don't think we need more social programs. I think we need to take away social programs a lot, a lot you know. Yeah, I agree. I think I think I've I've got a question for you, and I'll give you some some kind of background. 
what really makes me mad sometimes is that I've gone through stuff and then they change the laws to make it easier for everybody else behind me. Correct. Which is like, I've gone through this. I had to pay yeah. my 75 grand a year over three years of daycare per kid. Yeah. So I spent 150 on daycare alone. Now, four years later, they're taking my tax dollars to give it to somebody else yeah. for $10 a day. Okay. So I feel Correct. like I'm paying twice for this. So now you Correct. said it was hard for you to come to Canada, two and a half years, right? Yeah. Now, what do you think of it being super easy for just anybody to come in now? How is that? How does that affect you? Well, then you're going to have like the, the immigrants that are complaining because they got here and the, the accommodations were not good. It's like... The accommodations? Yeah. What do you need? But like, you're leaving. Well, then why didn't you stay? Accommodations? Yeah. Accommod we're providing accommodations? We're is that what we're doing? good enough hotels. Oh, no, good enough. We're yeah. providing accommodations, not good enough. Yeah, they're not. They're not good enough. And how much are they paying for these accommodations? I don't know, but uh, <laughs> they're not paying nothing. They're not paying nothing. That's no. right. And in the states too, right? They're doing the same thing in New York City. Yeah. They're putting up these hotels, yeah. or they're converting hotels, yeah. right? And schools. And schools. Yeah. Because there's not enough room in these five fancy hotels. I saw these yeah. people in New York City, and they look like very nice people. Not to do anything wrong with them, but they're getting stuff that ordinary Americans are not getting. Yeah. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I don't think it's fair. Well, the important voter, voters, I guess, I don't know what the situation is, but we we need to bring people that care about the country and the values of the country. We need to respect the flag, make that be the only flag that's being shown anywhere. Like, oh, we're going to bend over backwards for some demographic of people that maybe have a different or orientation. Well, that's cool. But then if, if we're going to play by those rules, if we're going to be inclusive then why are the schools not speaking Spanish, right? Because I don't feel represented. It's like, no, at what point do we stop it? I don't come here expecting the school system to teach Spanish because to accommodate for me, it's like I have to learn it. And it's the same way with everything. So genders, whatever, pronouns, all of that, right? I think we should get back to teaching science, math, biology, history. But yeah, in terms of the the, the question about Donald Trump, I think it's just exactly what we need. I, we need Trump, I think, I think we need logic. We don't need emotions right now. We don't need to like, yeah, we need just somebody who's just going to bring back the, the values. We don't want what's happening in Europe. Europe is too far gone. Uh, they, we, too much immigration yeah. was not a good thing for them. No, not at all. They, uh, all. And I think for, for to a certain extent in Canada, we want the immigration because we don't want our real estate market to fall. And if we're bringing in a million people a year in yeah. order to prop up that real estate market, I mean, these people have to live somewhere. They're not going to live off government subsidies forever. At some point, the credit card does get cut off and they do have to live somewhere. But I think we're bringing in more. I mean, you look at this neighborhood here, right? I only have two white people on my street. Everything else yeah. is from China. Okay, right. everybody on my street, they all have Porsches. They all have, uh, was it a Range Rover? Some lady's got a big Mercedes all Correct. on this street, a very fancy street. Yeah. And they don't seem to work. So I think that it's a two prong thing. We're letting in a whole bunch of people without papers, but we're also letting in a whole bunch of people that have money. And I think it's all to prop up our real estate. I don't know if you have an opinion on that. Yeah, which should be more regulated. Like to a certain extent, yeah. that's the reason why a 25 year old can't buy a house now. Correct, 100%. Right. It's it's, it's bringing up the market. So it's kind of a double edged sword. And the government's job is kind of to say, OK, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But if they did a little less of this, maybe a 25 year old could afford a house at this point. Yeah. So, yeah, you, it's funny because, yeah, you're, you're right. They're bringing two extremes. They're bringing the, the ones that don't bring anything mm -hmm. that are broke and they, uh, they're, they're taking shit on the beach. But then they also have the ones that like buy a bunch of apartments. And then you look at condos in Toronto that are vacant in a lot of vacant places where we need. You know, so like we're bringing super wealthy money and then no money and diseases and a whole bunch of other stuff and crime too as well. Right. Like why not bring in the happy medium? Yeah. And they 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 do help out the poor families in a certain sense is they they're really big on baby bonuses. Right. I don't know if you do yeah. this, but oh, like yeah, yeah. If, if you have five kids until they're 18, you're going to get a pretty fat check. Yeah, no, we month, call right? them pro professional moms, professional mom. You're getting three grand a month. Right. Yeah. So if you get welfare two and then you get three for the babies, then you're at five. Right. Well, yeah, five and then if you get a special halal diet, that's that's times and a half that. <laughs> Is halal cheaper than uh, than than say other uh, no? But like there is like the baby bonus will give you more if if you have a special diet based on your religious beliefs. No way. Yeah. Of course, Canada does that. Yeah. I, like I'm not surprised that they do that. When did this yeah. start? Under the Liberal government or when? Oh yeah, hundred percent. So that's why we need. Yeah, we need to take we need to take a lot of that stuff away. Number one, we need to take care of the elderly here because it's not fair. 
the, the veterans. It's a lot of homeless. If you drive around more like in the city or Chinatown, it's a bad sign where the, the demographic of your home of homeless people is it's like very younger than me. I'm 34. And I'm driving. I'm looking at this 25-year-old kid. Looks good. Looks like he could work, but he's homeless because the, the, the drug. Okay, so like drugs, they need to be back. You know, fuck the catch and release. The, the small petty crimes. We need to have better self-defense laws. Wish we had guns, the right to bear arms, but we don't have that here. But yeah, more self-defense. I wouldn't. I'm not. I'm not cool with drugs being the way they are to criminalize criminalized like that. It's too open. It's you too can, open. You're walking downtown. Yeah. And I'm seeing crack pipes for the first time yeah. in seven years. Yeah. Like I, I haven't seen a crack pipe in forever. I saw one in in yeah. seven years, and then after that, now I see one every single time I'm downtown. Mm -hmm. So. We've let the liberals they yeah. decriminalize most drugs because yeah. they're not druggies. They have a mental problem, and therefore yeah. we're going to let them do drugs because that's going to save them. Yeah, well, their budget is is on on keep keep enabling them with their drug abuse rather than re re rehab centers, giving them a safe place to do it yeah. so they don't overdose, as opposed to no, you can't do it. Let me take those drugs away. Yeah. Which is, which is a crazy concept. And yeah. I think we're seeing the results of it now. Yeah. It's open air drug use yeah. in places that people and families used to visit. And now you're downtown. There's for rent, for sale signs everywhere. Yeah. And only a few restaurants have survived because nobody wants to go and spend 300 bucks on dinner and walk out and see a crack pipe on the Correct. floor. Fighting and this and that. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty sad. That's why we need we need some way to, ch to shift. And I think it was going to happen. I think that the we always have this, you know, back and forth, two terms here, two terms on the right, two terms on the left. But like we need it, especially because the current administration is what prompted China and Russia to start working together, which is not good for anybody here. I think, I mean, the U.S. is the, the, is the top big dog in the world, you know, yeah. um, but I think complacency is it's a real thing. And um, I don't know. I like a world where, where America is in charge, to be honest. They build the best civilization that's ever existed in, in history, which was, you know, from built by the Europeans, by just hardworking people that, that believe in the American dream. I believe in the American, I believe in the Canadian dream. I'm leaving it, you know, and yeah, do I, I, do I like that the culture here, people are not as hungry? Yeah, but hey, man, that's, I'm here, I'm here with, I'm here to take people's jobs. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, I am going to agree with you. And most of the American progress yeah. was happening when all the other countries were kind of war-torn countries because the states bombed them all. Correct. So they've had this massive rise to greatness, right? Yeah. They built an empire, right? That's what they have. But they've also been complacent and they've gotten lazy, right? Yeah. Where the Chinese worker comes in, he's not complacent. No. He's not lazy, right? Yeah. And the Russian worker, they've been up, they've been down. Yeah. And at this point... I mean, they're still down because their economy is completely down. But, okay, let's focus on Russia a little bit for a second, okay? So Russia and China make this alliance. They're now part of BRICS, right, which is money for oil. BRICS nations, they're changing. Correct. The U.S. used to have the petrodollar, which they still do, and they're trying to enforce, and they kind of need it to prop up their dollar. But, you know, they're not necessarily getting along with Putin these days and, and Russia, and Russia's kind of fighting back this kind of monetary war. Now, do you think Russia actually wants a war given that what's going on in ukraine where the u.s is funding ukraine and putin is kind of fighting the war against ukraine it's kind of a proxy war for the united states yeah do you think if push comes to shove russia actually wants to provoke a war with the united states i don't i don't think they would want to because they, they just they won't nobody can win against the states nobody can win exactly um, but can they are they respecting the states for what, what, what they are? No, because of the current administration. They look at him as soft. Of course he's soft. Yeah. He can't even stand up. No, he can't. He can't even talk. He yeah. turns around for no reason during a speech, and then everybody else turns around. I don't know if you saw that at yeah, the no, memorial horrible. thing the other day. Yeah, yeah, I mean, how could you respect And then you look guy? at somebody like Vivek Ramaswamy, who's like 160 IQ, and you're like, this guy, like what, like the discrepancy between the talent and 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 logic is 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 massive yeah and that's i think that's why trudeau does so well because he looks good in front of people he's right? really yeah barack obama a very good speaker right Correct. he's good in front of people he can give yeah. you 20 minutes on everything make himself sound like mensa right yeah. trump also a very good speaker and that's what 100%. makes him sound really good plus yeah. he's a businessman so people like you and me kind of respect him because yeah. he's an entrepreneur because he's done it because he's done millions yeah. has he said stupid things of course he has 
He yeah. was a millionaire developer in New York when he was 30 years old. Yeah. He was a billionaire in New York. He's going to yeah. date supermodels. You don't think he's going to talk out of school sometimes? Like, this guy has done it. He's done everything, right? But a lot of the stuff he does, um, there's a book called Win, Win Bigly. It's a really good book. It kind of breaks down the whole strategy and Trump, how he does things. Think about all the little sound bites that he gave CNN and how much they use it. And they, they kind of give him all these millions of dollars in promotion. This case that he just had, that he's currently going with, um, that's, that's promotion for him. And every time they try to do something, it helps him. It's like they don't understand. Now, who do I worry about the left in the United States? That's a, a Trudeau kind of character. It will be Gavin Newsom. He's just very smart, articulate, very slick. But uh, we don't need we don't need more social programs. We need to close the borders. We need to get back to national like patriotism, respect the country. We need to bring those values back. I agree. And Gavin Newsom hasn't done really well for entrepreneurs. He's got a wealth no. tax. No, bro, everybody, everybody who's everybody in, in California moved to Texas. That's right. Except for like the show business and the woke billionaires millionaires but la it's 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 done it, it, you drive around pasadena or whatever or, or Cal i mean california it's really bad like i i for the crm stuff i had a company down in irvine that i was doing their, their stuff and i was doing mar um mortgage refis cash out helocs v like whether it was a v8 loan or whatever type of mortgages they have and yeah they're like yeah this is the worst market ever in in and the most expensive, California, the most expensive, overpriced, worst quality of life, which sucks because California has like amazing weather and be it's a beautiful place. It's absolutely beautiful. But, Everybody wants to visit there. It's just too far. Yeah. But Gavin Newsom, what he's done, he hasn't really fixed it. No. You're taking this beautiful place with kind of the most electoral votes in all, in all the United States, which yeah. is why he's got such a high profile. Yeah. But he's turned it from here to zero yeah. in, in four years. I, I, I don't think he's the one that moves on. It doesn't make any sense. No. And and back to your original point of Vivek, Vivek was really good, right? Yeah. And if he wasn't running against Trump, he actually might have had a chance, I think. Yeah, and hopefully he's the running mate with with Trump. Because yeah. you picture a guy Vivek debating Kamala Harris. He it's it's it doesn't make any sense. Like it's it's overkill. I mean he would destroy her. And the fact that they're debating and they have all these rules that are geared towards Biden's favor because why can't they just have an open conversation? Oh, no, they need to be 60 second questions and there's no audience, you know, and a lot of a lot of Trump's public speaking, it feeds off the crowd, you know, like you be in jail like this little that's not how he works. So they're taking away all his things. So it's like, I don't know, it, it makes no sense. There was a lot of talk about Michelle Obama potentially taking this spot. She would have been a threat because she's very likable. But I mean. People are not stupid. And you just have to look at everywhere. I mean, you can have a brand new phone. Because, yeah, the social media will teach you more of what you like. It, it knows what you like, and it will teach you more stuff. But you can get a brand new phone and look at videos of Biden, videos of Trump that has no previous history. You still see the comments. They're all leaning towards Trump, 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 Trump. You know? It really does seem like he's got the upper hand at this point. Yeah. It's, just, it's just really funny with everything that's going on. They tried to put him in jail. He did get convicted. Yeah. We're waiting sentencing. Sentencing is going to happen four days before the convention, before they actually rightfully choose him as the leader. Yeah. But I think it's backfired, right? Like the, the this whole thing is backfired against the Democrats. hundred percent. And New York as well. Like there were so many developments. Kevin O'Leary was talking about that. He's like, there's so many developments that were happening in New York and they're all just pulling out. They're going to Texas. They're going to Oklahoma. They're going to West Virginia, Florida. And you talk about... Which we're talking about Newsom. So look at compare Newsom with uh, DeSantis. You know, where do you want to go right now? You, everybody wants to go to Miami right now. Everybody does want to go to Miami. Yeah, yeah. Florida is very favorable. Everyone wants to go to yeah. Miami, but nobody wants to buy a condo there. Are you familiar with the condo situation in Miami? No. The um, a lot of these buildings were okay. Do you remember that collapse? There yeah. was a collapse at Seaside, not too far, right? Seaside's right. just down from Miami, right? Twenty minutes, something like that. And since that came in, there's a lot of recertifications that these buildings in Miami need, so upgrades, mm -hmm. and they have to happen more often. I think it was every fifty years, and now it's every thirty or twenty years, right? So all these buildings have to have these ten million dollar assessments, right? Divided by all the condo owners, so you get a one time bill in Miami for like a hundred grand, right? Well, most people that have already bought this condo in Miami, you're buying a a, a box for 
I don't know, four, 600,000 American, right? Of one bedroom, really small. Well, you can't necessarily afford a one-time $100,000 assessment, right? So all these condos are actually going on the market in Miami and they're driving down the price. So if you've got money to invest, go to Miami now. Once this is kind of passed, once these assessments are passed, then your condo is going to be worth a lot more. Anyway, wow. it's an interesting, it's an interesting app. And so this, all this recertification for safety is actually costing the, co- the, the homeowner quite a bit more, right? Wow. Yeah. That's cool, man. Yeah. Okay. I got one more question for you. Yes. What do you think of Tesla's EVs or any electric vehicle versus a gas powered vehicle today and maybe in the next five years? What are we looking at? Yeah. I think Tesla's drivers are the new BMW drivers. <laughs> Does it really like they just drive fast? They just they they're just like run the, into the tailgate. They're, they're the douchebags now. <laughs> really, I call them super drivers, but maybe it's somebody else. I don't know. True. Um, no, I think I mean that that technology is here to stay. You know, uh, okay. it, but it's gonna take a lot longer than than what people estimate. Like I don't I don't think in the next ten years all the cars are gonna be EVs, drivers, self driving vehicles. You know. Uh, I don't I don't think so. But I mean, who am I? I just don't I don't see that happening. These things move very, very slow. Um, I mean, but yeah, Tesla is really just a data company. They're not really a, a car company. They're scouting. I mean, their ambition is to have this self-driving car. So every car is collecting terabytes of data as they drive. So what and, you're saying is, is Tesla is just doing it for the software and then in the end maybe power all the car manufacturers with the tesla self-driving software is that that yeah they have the like the is? most they have the most data yeah so money the money's in the, the software it's got nothing to do with the car or the factory. yeah they're, they're making money on the cars for sure but like the fact is that that data the driving the sensors all of that stuff that they're recording with every car i mean that's extremely that's probably worth more than the revenue on, on the margins of, of selling the vehicle is, is getting all that data. That's really interesting. And yeah. I, I do think cars are overpriced though. And, and what's really weird about cars being overpriced and, and versus, you know, okay, you save money on gas, but you don't really save money. No, on no, gas. no, you that's save, just a gimmick. You yeah. save maybe like, it's not free. You still got to power it. You still got to plug yeah. it in. It, it takes more energy than your air conditioner. So it's definitely yeah. something, right? But there's a car being made in China for $10,000, right? right? But the States are slapping 100% tax on this car before it hits the US shores, right? Mm. So that car is, is, and I think it's even more than that. I think they went to 150, Biden just changed it to 150. Mm. So they're not letting Tesla compete fairly. And these are the kinds of things that we complain about all the time, a fair playing field. But if they're adding that, then there's no benefit to Tesla dropping their price or making Correct. vehicles cheaper. So maybe it's the government's fault that yeah. like we're not there yet. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. But yeah, everything right now is data. Everything right now, it's everything you do is training a system. So I'll give you a little uh, f- a fun note here just to wrap things up. Every time you, they, they, they own these companies that, that to prove you're not a robot on every website. Yeah, I'm not a robot. Yeah. What do they ask you to recognize? Like, uh, I hate this. I always get it right and then I always get it wrong at the same time and it makes no sense to me. There's like bicycles right. or like buses or hydrants. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. S- stuff that would help self-driving cars if they understand what's a fire hydrant and what isn't. Do you get it? So we're teaching? They're, we're, they're yeah. teaching us or they're learning we're, from we're, us? We're, we're teaching le- it. We're teaching it. What is the fire hydrant? Everything you see is for like the road. What is no the sidewalk? Way. What is the street lights? What is a, like the what is a bus? What is in a bus? It, and who's who's collecting this data? The, these are the data intelligence firms, and they're selling it to to the car to like the Teslas and the self driving vehicles. Wow, that's how important this data is. So they're killing two, killing two birds with one stone. Yeah, they're doing the the captcha. That's the human the thing, verification. Yeah, right. But pay attention. It's a lot of it is it's on the road. Is that why it's getting tougher and tougher these days for me to pass that capture? I seem to have to go through Correct. two every time. Correct. Yeah. And it's like a one little like pixel where it's the, the remaining of the light or whatever. And you don't know if you press it or not. So, but what's the answer? Is it like, I don't like know. If they tell me the bike, right? <laughs> they tell me the bike and there's a dude on the bike, right? Yeah. So is the dude part of the bike or is it just the bike? Because I don't know. Sometimes I do it. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I, don't I pass. Sometimes I don't. So there's, there's I don't know. So I wish maybe somebody could blow and tell me. Yeah, I do think there's like a scoring system. Like you know, you, it's not a hundred percent. Like you, you could pass at like fifty, like eighty percent if you get the guy or not. And they probably 
determining how many people get the guy and that they don't get the, it's just there's it's a lot more behind it than the, the just verification it's social accounting there is yeah is. phone a friend but okay. think about how important it is to get the data for for the car manufacturers that they're collecting it that way that you're training them to understand like which one of this is a fire hydrant what belongs to the to the sidewalk uh sign the street lights everything you see now and, and, and next time you you you, you notice it you Next time you do it, you're going to notice yeah. that that's what it is. Yeah, that's pretty insane. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I like it. 